this is Ken McDonald, Tape 4. Ken, with your post-war commitment to social justice, how did your war experiences affect your own personal attitudes towards war and peace? <laughs> I'll enlarge a little bit about that. I wonder what my life would have been without uh, the tent. I'll just expand a little bit. I was a well-trained attorney. I was well-established in a fine law firm in Boston. I would have, I think, lived a pretty decent life of climbing, sailing, uh, gradually doing pretty well. Uh, but almost I'm a little embarrassed about it. My law firm thinks I'm, they must think I'm crazy, but I probably am. But I think that the tenth just changed my life dramatically. Now, uh, I have been involved for a long time in endless social causes. And I have a letter to Eleanor, which I'll share with you, of in the 45th General Hospital, of a black man who was in the, uh, in the bed alongside of me. And the amount of time that he and I talked. Now, I had no idea about race then. I've spent a lifetime, my life portion about race since then. But that perhaps started then. And I think that I had an ability to know about the aspirations of people and how important people are and how important even minor courage is. And I choose to think that much of that came from uh, the 10th Mountain Division. Uh, and I won't expand, expand on what's happened since then, but I happen to be uh, on all sorts of boards and education boards and uh, across the country and other things and awards and uh, although those are I'm pleased to get them I do think that those all have a trace back to uh, the 10th Mount Division maybe it may be subjective I may be completely wrong uh, plus Eleanor shared it so that um, she knew what was going on. It wasn't strange to her. And I think, it isn't, isn't your question, I'm, if anybody is interested, as you are, truly interested, if somebody wants to talk about war, I'll talk about war, but I don't want to do it for sheer entertainment. How did your experience in the military shape your attitudes about war? Well, let me go back to an earlier question. First, I think your question was my feelings about war and peace, and I think I talked about general social issues of race, gender, class, etc. Uh, but when you ask about my impact about war, I am not a pacifist, uh, not a complete pacifist, uh, but I have come to believe that unless we can do something about war, the desire to go to war, the craziness of how terrible it is, and how we can't understand it. I truly believe in the long run that civilization is doomed. I don't think that we can handle it by all the reasons. We always have a reason to go to war. We always have a reason to kill. Kill them for whatever reason. And if it solved anything, it would be fine. And I think that uh, not in terms of a good war. I think that World War II was justified. That's a big thought coming from me. Uh, but I think that so many other things really are not justified. We have no idea what, what it is in Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam was communism or oil. Iraq, it seems to me, endlessly has to be about oil, has to be about uh, uh, money, has to be about class. And uh, it can't go on. We just can't go on killing, 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 having increased, and along with it, cutting back on the social fabric all across the world. Uh, and if we want to do it, uh, that's fine. I can live in this security here on Mercer Island, but that's not the end, end result. That's not the way we can go. 
Um, does it mean a lot to you to have been in the 10th Mountain Division? To have what? Does it mean a lot to you to have been in the 10th Mountain Division? Oh, I think, uh, as I said, my law firm thinks me I'm crazy. I uh, always talk about Company L, almost everywhere, a connection. For instance, Wales Kennedy's uh, father-in-law is the associate dean of the School of Law at the University of Washington. Uh, I joke so much about Company L because I always talk about it. it uh, it would seem almost, it's not true, but that it uh, is parallel to my thoughts of the importance of the law. Uh, but the experience is profound, just absolutely profound. And it's one that I would not have missed. Uh, what does it mean to you to have been part of the 10th Mountain Division? Oh, I, I think it's... Uh, uh, an uplift. I think I'm very proud to be in the 10th. I don't have many contacts other than my own uh, squad or platoon or company, but I think that uh, the 10th Mountain Division is a fine symbol and it lasts. And I think that anybody who contributed to the bearings and ideals of the 10th Mountain Division uh, we are worthy of praise. Now that doesn't mean that the tenth didn't screw up, screw things happen, but it's been a fine, fine model for me. And I think if the nation is concerned, or if they're curious for the nation. Tell me a little bit about what you did when the tenth mountain was reassigned up along the Yugoslavian border to hold the line against Tito's forces. Can you recall that period of time? And you can can you tell me what you remember about it? Are you talking about post-war? Uh, post armistice, but before they had drawn the border. Well, I, I at, at that time I would have thought, and I think now that it was important to control Tito. Now Tito was our friend at that time, essentially our friend, but nevertheless we wanted to control. Now, people don't know that the most of what the Italian, the Italians had land all the way down the Dalmatian coast. Uh, Italy had great uh, expansion desires and so did uh, Yugoslavia. Now, I ran across from some place that Stalin had made a deal that if the uh, Italians, and they died in Russia. They were sent to Russia. Uh, that he would give some of their land uh, or, or to them. And the story is that he did send some Cossacks to join with the Italians to take some of that land near Trieste. Now, uh, that's a rumor that's in history. I used to ask 10th guys. The 10th guys were in Udine. And as a part of history, I said, do you know anything about Udine or the river? Uh, a million people, Germans, died, I'm sorry, Italians, died there uh, on the Isonzo River. Not a person has ever heard of Udine. But what do you remember from your time there, you personally? Where were you stationed? Well, I'm. Oh, and all I know is that Company L finally got to Udine, that very time. Uh, but this is only an example of how can you stop warfare if nobody knows about what happened to the Italians at at Udine in the Austrian-Hungary War. I once read in the Harvard Law Bulletin, some guy wrote in and said about the. German, so the Italian soldiers, the only thing they were good for was making love and playing the guitar. When you were in Udine, tell me what the role was. Oh, I, I was not in Udine because uh, Udine would have been long after uh, the crossing of the Po. Udine was at the very top. That was when. Oh, I thought you were. Oh. No. Tell at me a little bit about what you observe about the modern 10th Mountain Division. My experience is limited to really maybe two days at Fort Drum 
and I was tremendously impressed by the size, the physiques, the uniforms of those men and their discipline. And we had a battalion commander speak to the tent, who was beyond belief, just a very, very interesting man. And uh, I have watched only that with, when the tent, what they did, when they went to Florida in the hurricane, they went to uh, Black Hawk days, uh, they were in Black Hawk just briefly. They went to uh, Afghanistan, and they've been on call for very important matters. And it seems to me, from what you read anyway, that they have always done well and been very proud of them. Do you see any kinds of parallels between the active 10th Division and the original 10th Division? Well, I don't know anything about it. I, I see a parallel because, at least as I hear, the modern 10th Division is very proud of its ancestry, uh, and I enjoy that. And when the time that I was at Fort Drum, only one or two nights, they certainly spoke of that pride, and that carries forward my pride of the 10th Mountain Division into what's going on today, and I think that's very important. In what way do you think the active 10th Mountain Division embodies the ideals or carries on the values of the original 10th Mountain? The present 10th? Yeah, how do they embody the ideals and values? Well, uh, as I see it, one, they, the people that I've seen or heard about are intelligent, Secondly, they're physically fit. Thirdly, they're in a very rough terrain. People don't know that the coldest place in America is Fort Drum in Watertown, New York. Uh, and it seems to me that they are prepared to go. And finally, the 10th Mountain Division, when somebody would let us go, were prepared. And when they got on that boat and got off, they had a mission to do, and they did it. And I think that's carried over into the present one. What kind of legacy do you think the 10th Mountain Division has? What does it have? What kind of legacy does your 10th Mountain Division leave behind? Well, I think that, uh, again, they leave behind of people who went through uh, great hardship. Hardship in Camp Hale was much more difficult than hardship in battle other than uh, uh, bullets. Uh, and, so, and I think that secondly, we served briefly, but we were called upon to do a job, and in uh, less than four months, we accomplished that job, uh, ended the war in Italy, but people may not recall that we tied down German troops uh, in southern Europe and were a part of uh, the breakthrough. And uh, that was in part of to secure uh, the southern borders. Uh, and I think all of that is high, high priority, good stuff. And the tenth did it, and why not be proud of it? Now, the tenth was just a minor blimp about war. Don't get me talking about Guadalcanal or Tarawa or Saipan. Uh, Iwo Jima has just been celebrated. Iwo Jima was the same night as Belvedere, same night. On Iwo Jima, 17,000 people died. And people in the tent have to recognize that. Uh, only for facts, we have to recognize that 47,000 Americans died in Okinawa. Uh, now, as a little bit on that, we talk about the 10,000 people who died in uh, the invasion. And that's very significant, but there were far more people who died the next three weeks in trying to break through the dikes and the hedgerows in France to say nothing of the Battle of the Bulge. The people in the Battle of the Bulge had far worse temperatures than we ever did, and they did not have equipment. The Battle of the Bulge is the toughest fighting in American history. Uh, and so the 10th shouldn't be saying, well, we're the equal of those 
people we should be saying, oh, if we say anything, look, you guys are tremendous guys and we're part of it. We're not competing with them. We found a duty at a time and place and circumstances and we all tried to meet that duty and uh, ultimately a solution came. Now that's hardship and then I, just in conclusion of this little bit, Americans have to recognize that if we're at war, we're at war. What are we doing? What, what's happening to move this along? And for most people, life goes on as usual, but that's not true for those poor bastards in Iraq. Let me know. And you can go? Okay. 4 March, 1945. Quote, when the sun shines in Italy, it is wonderful, and it is shining now. I am sitting on my pack, airing my feet and socks like a good soldier, avoiding trench foot. There is an appalling contrast to death, injury, noise, fear, cold, hunger, and sleeplessness here in these mountains. The mountains are majestic and fierce and snow-covered. Looking at them casually, one would think them in, uninhabited instead of full of, of killers. Can you read that sentence again, please? Uh, There's an appalling contrast. There is an appalling contrast to death, injury, noise, fear, cold, hunger, and sleepy, sleepiness here in these mountains. The mountains are majestic and fierce and snow-covered. Looking at them casually, one would think them uninhabited instead of full of killers. One picture I have with each new foxhole is to look out the top and, ha and have its side frame mountains or a single airplane lazily flying high in a bright blue sky. The Italian fertile mountainsides with towns on the mountain slopes are a scene for a guidebook. And while watching such a scene, one can spot airplanes or artillery devastating the town completely. Almost every town in Italy has been destroyed, at least in part. There are no roads or railroads or ports here anymore except for those which the army chooses to maintain. Excellent. And March 7th. March 7th, 1945. Darling, your paper, which you send over from the States, really comes in handy, even if it comes back all beat up. I carry it in my pocket, steal a little ink when I can, and write when I can. I am now sitting on the edge of my improved foxhole, parentheses, straw has been added in parentheses, writing on the edge of it of a sea ration wooden box container. This is the steepest slope almost that I have ever lived on. I actually have blisters on the sides of my feet from walking along the edge of it. And shoe packs aren't the great support. But in another month or so, I should change to other shoes. These Germans are the poorest looking bunch of men I have ever seen. Behind machine guns and mortars, they are good. And how de devastating those their mortars can be. But in close, they quit and pronto. I have flushed them out with hand grenades and they take off. One day I will tell you about our original attack, storybook, storybook stuff, and our desire to get in close scattered Germans all over Italy. Their clothes are completely inadequate, ragged, shabby, and not heavy winter stuff. Some of it is ridiculous, wooden shoes with a canvas cover. Most need shaves, are overworked and underfed, and many are downright disgusted and glad it is over. I have seen many, many, and nothing superior, 
except behind a machine gun. Okay, and this will be March 18th. March 18, 1945. Darling, let me tell you about my little house. It is six feet deep, has a roof three feet thick of earth, logs, and sandbags. My next project is to tunnel back into the mountain and build earthen shelves and a little kitchen. The exit is just large enough for my body. We and the Germans shell and machine gun each other frequently. And believe me that it is a lumpy business. Anybody who moves during the daylight draws fire. Week after week of this is pretty tedious, but dangerous and unpleasant as it is for us, it is 30 times worse for Jerry. But what a hate one gets when these bastards make life so damnably miserable for us. And this is March 19th. March 19th, 1945. Darling, have had my head only out of my foxhole trying to get a little sun, but it is too disrupting to bob down dodging shells, which at least sound dangerous, and so am now way down deep and comfy. It is irrational to get so damn angry at Jerry because he is only doing his job as we are. But irrational or not, what a great anger we have when little items of war, of our shabby life, like urinating, have to be done furtively. Here we are about here, they shoot at us. And problems like putting, putting, getting, I'm sorry, and problems like getting wood involves a considerable risk of life by carrying it. Time magazine says the GI, GI is now really angry at Germans. After months of this, it is inevitable that he should be. This stored up anger will surely be released upon many innocent but Germans, but, 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 upon many innocents, but Germans aren't innocent. And they are going to pay a heavy price for the inconveniences and relative miseries of hundreds of thousands of young Americans. As I wrote once, I am willing to give a year to occupying their country, and time says so is the average GI. Before this experience, an army occupation was anathema to most, but now it will make things pay, and if it will help prevent another, way, another war, I think men will gladly do it. But think of the time. It is almost nine, three years since I graduated from law school. And of that time, I have put in seven months of law and have been away from you, my wife, for nine more. Thank the Lord that we married early and had fun. We both have pleasures now too. But as you say, it is a suspended animation and so much time is being lost. As a part of one's life, I don't mind serving the country. In fact, I am proud of it. But the big issue now is the time when we can't live together. And of course, the miserable business of splendid lives lost or greatly impaired. Our scenery is as always delightful. We are on the down slope. Belvedere is way behind and is undoubtedly the highest mountain in our immediate vicinity. So progress has been made. It was like the movies, only better. We made our original tack with drawn bayonets, hand grenades, rifle grenades, and that was all, underscored, and that was all. We took the mountain and had orders underlined not to fire a single round of rifle, mortillery, mortar, artillery, or machine gun ammunition. This sounds like Errol Flynn, but we did it and so frightened the Germans.
frightened the Germans so that many gave up in sheer fright. But think of them sitting there and seeing masses of big Americans advancing constantly with cold steel and ready to use it too, and watching one town gradually disintegrate under German shell fire. This was Castle Diano. Each morning it looks a little more shabby, yet its most prominent tower still stands. See, this is pretty. And this is from March 20th, 1945. March 20th, 1945. Times are tough here too. And in spite of it, I haven't found much religious religion per se in foxholes. Men have thought of previously wasted time and perhaps new standards of conduct or attitudes after the war. But real terrific fight doesn't put these men on their knees. More than once, I have been so frightened that I wrote off my living. But at these times, I didn't think of God. I wondered how I would even tell you what it was really like, or why in hell we as rational men were doing this to each other. In my fear, I was philosoph philosophizing, philosophizing? philosophizing as much as I can, parentheses, not much, in parentheses, but about us and our relations to this whole thing. Not about God, and I am not an, a an atheist. Once I wrote you a letter in which I s said a lot of nasty things about Germans. We moved before I could send it, and the next day or so, as we worked like hell against the crowd. Then came the large counterattack, and mortar and artillery fire for four hours. I was in a new outpost which we had been ordered to build during the day. So the Germans knew exactly where we were, and that night we caught it. Hours on end so close that I could smell the powder of the exploding shells, feel the concussions. Indeed, in the morning, ammo boxes on top of the dugout were riddled with shrapnel, and a knoll like ours, 20 feet away, had been eliminated completely. Well, anyway, I was so scared that down at the bottom of that miserable hole, I tore up the ladder so that the Germans wouldn't read it. But I wasn't thinking of religious religion. My thoughts, I hope, were more pointed. Enough of this. Okay, this is March 26, 1945. March 26, 1945. Darling, yesterday was the saddest day in the Army, and I guess in my life. This whole business suddenly caught up with me, plus more friends gone. I was beyond my depths, completely unable to figure out this business and reduced to sobbing in my sleeping bag for about 10 minutes before getting up. A fine state of affairs, but I am on my feet again now. One day, maybe I will write you this, I will write some of this business to you and ask for help in the spiritual sense, but for now, our to-be-born son or child is worry enough, and I am okay. This is like a raw March day working on the boat. The mountains look pretty stern in the clouds, and it is quite cold and windy. Guess we are in for some mean weather soon. However, the Western Front seems to be having Excellent weather now. I am well, but jumpy, and anxious to move off this spot. This is Del Mount Delos Bay. Had some different rations today, and they helped out considerably. I have some law reports here. That was a Northeast section of reporter, but current events have always seemed so important and compelling that dry law reports are pretty stiff things in which to get interested. So every minute of every day isn't 
exactly counting now, but I find that time goes quickly and I keep pretty busy meeting the suggestions, criticisms, and war exigencies of the platoon. Recently, as a part of my job, I've had to select and send our boys to fight, send out our boys to fight. That is one of the most unpleasant tasks I have ever had. My decisions send them out, and then I sweat it out. It is rough. However, oh, I'm sorry, I haven't seen Ed for a week now. Guess he is okay, though. Yesterday was Palm Sunday, and next week is Easter Sunday, Shades of Ptarmigan. Ptarmigan refers to Camp Hale. But as I knew and stated then, that was terribly rough physically. This winter has been easier than that on the body, provided, providing we can stay clear of bullets and shrapnel. But even to those who are well, this is more unpleasant than ptarmigan. There we had the elements alone, and we could win. Here we can win physically, too. But sometimes the men chosen to be killed leave one in a daze. The very best seem to go. And after a while of facing that over and over again, one finds a subtle enemy working, a subtle enemy working on one's brain, and he is a tough one. As always said at Hale, rough as it is, it is better than the fronts overseas. Behind the lines here and elsewhere is another story. But the minority up front anywhere, as well as men who withstood Camp Hale, have my respect. All of them. Now when we say at the bottom... Okay, and tell... And go ahead. Are we going to give a date? Yes, March 29th. Okay. Now that's... Excuse me, that's talking about patrol activities and that's referring indirectly to what's happened. Do you want to bet... Do you want to start a little earlier? No, that's all right. Okay, March 29th, 1945. March 29th, 1945. I write, quote, usual patrol activities in Italy, and I'm referring to the slight inserts in the newspaper, quote, usual patrol activities, end quote. Almost always men get wounded and killed on patrols. It is close, intimate fighting. A few by stealth against many entrenched, probing for enemy positions and strong points. It is always in or behind German lines and definitely not fun. But the newspaper reader, parentheses, nor should he, parentheses, does not understand how tough this st static front is. Plenty of boys get it here, and the front page knows nothing about it. I helped carry Toga Tokel off the mountains. That was harsh. Born in Norway, fame and fortune in America, killed on an Italian mountainside, hard to figure out. Because, and I've got to check with, uh, if I don't find it for Jim, uh, the morning reports show the dates, but they don't show precisely where. They'll say Gaggio Montano, and it's not Gaggio Montano. Well, what happened is that uh, Torga Tokel and a fellow named Arthur Tokola, and Tokola was carrying some mortar shells. And he got hit by our artillery, and the mortar shells blew up. And he, I'm not going to detail, his body was blown everywhere in small pieces, as you read about in Iraq. And Toga Tokel was right alongside of him, and he was killed by a large wound in the back, but his body had not deteriorated. And I was in that area for two or three days, and soldiers came from considerable distance to look at this terrible scene. 
And finally, Captain Eggleston called and said, Mac, we've got to get rid of those bodies. So I took, asked three people in my platoon to get rid of the bodies. And indeed, I uh, took hold. I had nothing left but one leg and a tendon. And I chopped off that leg and then put, had his body put into a basket. We talk about basket cases, and the only way you can survive these things is with humor. So I said, here's a basket case, and I put his limbs into the basket and had somebody carry his torso down in a canvas uh, cover. Uh, but to go through that was just very, very hard, and that happens every day. That happens. Um, and in my case, uh, I only did it by some small display of irony, and that's what happened. Yes. Okay, and we're starting now. It's uh, April 18th. April 18th, 1945. I really got socked by a couple of German mortars, but I am now so safe and okay. I was surely lucky. They put one piece of shrapnel right through the back of my helmet and into my scalp, but my head skull stopped it. Another hunk went into my back. It fractured my left scapula compoundly, but stopped before it hit my heart. A second shell dented my right side into my ribs and some on my leg. But all the metal is out, and other than feeling as though I'd been clubbed by a ball bat for an afternoon, I am okay. All taped up and pretty, and no hair in the back of my head. My left arm and shoulder don't work yet. Can you read to the end? In spite of the above, I waited for three hours for any chance and took off over the mountains to a mile and a half on the run, underscored. It was either get out or never get out. So I came, you bet. The only one I kept thinking of was here yesterday. It was for me to get out because of you and our child about to be born. more. Please write and tell me about uh, him or her. I have a diagnosis which I will send you when I can and when you can get the lowdown. I want to tell you about it all, but right now I am still a bit groggy. I knew that I was going to get hit, but I was sweating out not getting killed. What a day for that. A lucky guy, too.